Hey, what is going on, YouTube? Welcome to the Four Reefer Show, including myself, Aaron's Aquariums, Reef Dudes, and an appropriate reefer. Now, this is going to be a show to where we all come together every week and discuss reef topics in the hobby, whether it be beginner, intermediate, and maybe advanced topics later down the road if we get that far. But the main thing is to provide you guys with just a little bit of content a little bit of entertainment for your saturday mornings now if you missed the first episode it's going to be over on michael's channel over at aaron's aquariums where we talked about everything you need for transitioning from fresh water to salt water you know things you should think about things you should not do maybe ways to save money or even you know if you should even do it at all at that point so you know if you missed it definitely go check it out episode two is here Episode three will be over on Reef Dudes channel. Episode four will be over on an appropriate reefers channel. Make sure you subscribe to all of us because we're gonna come, you know, we're gonna come every week at you, every Saturday, giving you guys hopefully 30 minutes of great entertainment, and we shall keep this going on. Now, at the end of this, make sure if there's a topic you want discussed or if there's something you do want covered that we missed, drop it down in the comments below because you never know we may use your question and use it for our next show. So with all that being said, the topic for this week is one that uh, has affected us all so deeply in this hobby, including myself. If you guys understand the trials and tribulations I've had on this 120 gallon tank, and that is algae and what we can do to prevent it, to overcome it, and hopefully defeat it long-term in the hobby. So let's go ahead and get to it two one now before we get too far and as far as my personal issues we got three other reefers on here that have had their own fair share of issues with algae so we're going to go through share our stories our successes our triumphs because obviously we're all still standing and hopefully give you guys the encouragement you need to get past your algae issues well we're going to start off with the man the myth the legend an appropriate reefer. <laughs> Tell us, uh, give us a little bit of insight as far as your experience with algae, at least what you think started the algae issues in your tank, and then we'll go to everyone else as far as what we think started the issue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I've had a lot of algae issues, and I, I think a lot of it comes from me using tap water for about 10 years. Uh, so hair algae, people are laughing right now already. So hair algae <laughs> was a constant in my reef tank. And that's also why I call myself the inappropriate reefer because people are like, what, using tap water? Um, how's, that, how's that working out for you? I always thought it's fine because I thought algae is normal because I always see that in my tank. Uh, so for me, switching over to algae water water was, uh, was, was, was huge. So besides, I had in contact with hay algae, cyanobacteria, dino algae, and right now I'm actually battling some uh, bubble algae as well. So today I'm here to learn. Obviously, I have not mastered the arts of defeating algae because I still have algae issue. But they all seem to uh, follow certain things. I, I feel, always have like excess nutrient. That's when I see a algae bloom. And that's when they will compete whatever I have in the refugium. Um, so I'm really interested to see how you guys deal with uh, noise sense algae as well. Good deal. Good deal. Well, right now we're going to touch on, I guess, why we all feel like we started the issue. Then we're going to circle back around and hopefully touch on how we all defeated it and compare commonality. So next up, let's go Reef Dudes. Tell us uh, about how you may have started issues or not ever had issues with algae. So I've actually always been extremely paranoid about having algae in my tank. So any sign of it, I've tried to eradicate it before it came into an issue. Uh, I, do, I do really believe prevention is one of the biggest things because it's much easier to prevent algae than to have to deal with it after the fact. Um, so I, I've refused to ever use tap water in my tank. I've used RODI water from day one. Um, even before I got in the hobby, I used to do like freshwater shrimp in planted tanks. And even then I used RODI water to lower the TDS of the water. So it was more pure and lower pH for the little crystal shrimp. So I had an RO unit before it. So I just added DI onto it once I had gotten to reefing. And since then I've upgraded to a fancier unit that's more pure and dual DI and all that stuff. But I've always been extremely paranoid against getting algae in my tank. So I put a lot of preventative. Um, from that, I also, from day one of starting, actually my nano tanks I didn't, I used Chemi Pure Blue, which has um, like a phosphate remover into it. So I've always used some form of a phosphate remover. 
Um, so it's even my larger tanks. Um, even this large tank, I did use GFO from day one as preventative. Now, before I knew any better, I learned my lesson because too much GFO can actually kill your corals or it will strip the zoo axle off of it. So you need to, you know, use it with a grain of salt, like use it cautiously, do not overdo it. So I just want to stress that anyone who uses it, do not overdo it. So day one, I've always used right. it, even now I use it, but just on like a tiny trickle of flow. Now, that being said, I mean, so... yep. There's a go. So I still go have ahead. had... Now I'm okay. Yeah, so I still have bits of algae pop up. Like, you know, you get the odd little tufts of hair algae and different stuff that have shown up on my rocks over time. Or if you have a chunk of dead coral, sometimes they'll grow on there. Um, anytime I see that type of stuff, I'll break it off. Or if there's a tuff, I'll literally pull it out with my water hose and I do a water change. Um, another big tip, I get people to kill small amounts at a time. Um, if you use H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide, you can turn off your flow and spot treat it with algae. Like you don't want to use too much in your tank, but just take your five, 10 mil syringe and squirt a couple of mils on the problem spot and it will kill it. Like it will turn white over time. Die. So usually I'll do that for a couple of days of any spots that I see is more preventative. So you take care of it before it grows and spreads too much in your tank. There you go. So it looks like, hey, Reef Dudes is on it. I mean, without a doubt. And I tell you what, great, great, great advice when it comes to tackling things before they progress too far. We're going to circle back around to more ways to attack algae and get rid of it. But before we do that, we got to go over to Michael. Let him share his experience as far as what he may have done wrong to cause algae issues in this tank. <laughs> So yeah, so um, on the previous version of this tank, which I now call this V2 version 2 of the wife, uh, if you watch my reef updates. Now on version 1 of this tank, I was having algae issues and it was down to the fact that I had um, very high nutrient levels. My nitrates and my phosphates were just through the roof. Now, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get those nitrates and phosphates down. You know, I just couldn't work it out. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I know how to, you know, manipulate and how to get nitrates and phosphates down. But everything that I tried, like what uh, Devon has just said, uh, Reef Dudes has just said there about using GFO, you know, use GFO, also use lanthium chloride, which is great for reducing phosphate, phosphates, you know, cleaning my gravel, all sorts of different things. But I just couldn't get it down. So which meant that I was having a lot of hair algae because I also had very bright lights. I was running T5 lights as well as LEDs. So I just, I just couldn't get my head around it at all. And it was just, it was just growing for fun. In the end, I worked out what was going on, the reasons why my nutrient levels were just so high. And it was because um, one of my rock structures were was just like, it was a trap. It was a toilet, basically. There was so much waste underneath the rocks in one of the rock structures. It was making it like impossible to get my nutrient levels down because it was all collecting with inside my cave in my rock structure. Now the cave was quite big. It was about two, two foot in length. And you know, it's like a two by two cave. So it was trapping all sorts. So in the end, I ended up basically closing the tank down. And that's how I found out about all of the waste and that was a big sort of like influence on this tank the ver uh, the second version um because now that these the rocks these very small footprints you know these these only small amounts of rock actually touching the floor and that was influenced from the previous version of the tank where you know a lot of waste was congregating so that's the reason why and that's how i sort of like got around hair algae in this system by you know being more proactive with the scape itself um, which meant that, you know, I, I could work on my nutrient levels a lot easier. Um, so that's that's how I got around it. And that's how I'm uh, able to not have that much hair algae in this system right now. Good deal. Good deal. So just listening to you guys, you know, testimonies, if you want to call it that, as far as your algae or not having algae issues, it seems like a few things we all have in common. You know, first of all, the type of water you're putting in your tank as an appropriate reefer mentioned he was using tap water to start off second has to do with maintenance as far as trying to tackle it before it gets out of hand third had to do with your rock now honestly in my case i would consider my rock 
as being one of my major issues. And not only this tank, both tanks I've had. Even in the JBJ, I started off with the Marcos Dry Rock, and this tank started with the Bucani Dry Rock. Both dry rock, both uncured rock, and both rock that I threw right in the tank and let it cycle with, you know, the lights coming on a little too early. So I would say uh, number one thing I think I did wrong in my case, in both cases, was not curing the rock over time. Uh, in the dark, multiple water changes, exporting the nutrients, letting it get all the death and decay and everything else out before doing it into display. So personally, this is something that I think a lot of new hobbyists and not of new reefers will run into is the nuisance algae, not the algae that, you know, kill your tank like bryopsis or something. But I mean the nuisance algae, the green hair algae, the diatoms, the stuff that if you don't know any better is enough to aggravate you. So it's good to know that, hey, you guys are not alone. All of us are experiencing it, have experienced it or still is experiencing it during this time in our hobby. So I guess uh, we can switch it over to what we're going to do to get past it. And I tell you what, I'm going to go back to inappropriate reefer because during his trials and tribulation with algae, if you guys are not subscribed to him, go do it. He has shared with us some crazy methods of trying to deal with his algae. And I really want him to go in and share us with all those different things you tried, man. Go ahead. <laughs> oh man, where do I even start? Um, okay, to, let, let me show the Bendate method first, like the, the, the ones that I find actually is really effective. Um, so laid out worked really well for me, regardless of what kind of algae. Um, I would put the tank through maybe like three days, five days, and even I haven't even tried like a six day blackout. Uh, coral fish, all no issues, um, all the algae, will be will be receded or completely gone but the thing is that they always come back if the underlying issue is still there uh so for me uh what ultimately end up working is number one of course switching to LDI water from tap water and number two is that uh, as i was building up my refugium i was taking a closer look to my refugium i found that there's actually a lot of detritus uh trap in there similar to what michael was saying a little bit earlier in terms of a uh, big piece of rock so i used to have a lot of live rocks in the uh in the refusing section and the flow is not strong enough to kind of stir everything up so there's actually a lot of crap just stuck there and so what i ended up doing is that i switch over to a uh, to our dia water i just completely redone the entire refugium upgraded the pump and i just added a power head to the back of the display tank to make sure there's more flow just to make sure the entire system is a lot cleaner than what it was before and just kind of blow uh blow in use the turkey baster blow out all the uh, little holes and crevices in the rock to kind of make sure nothing is settled in there and um and i also introduce different varieties of macro so it's not just shadows it may be like um, gray algae and stuff like that too and i do find that in my system for whatever reason the uh, the great algae is doing a lot better than chados so a combination of all these things seems to really turn the tank around so the algae is a little bit more under control uh so although recently i started seeing some of the uh algae coming back notice an algae coming back but i, I kind of contribute that to me feeding a lot heavier because some of my fish are getting a little bit larger and they have a higher bio load so i feel like um, my bio load is also overloading my tank now and so i'm in the process of actually catching some fish and giving them away but um Along the way, I tried a lot of crazy things like CJ say, including uh, uh, in, in conjunction with light out, I also dose like uh, hydrogen peroxide to combat uh, dino algae. But I'm sure we'll get a little bit more into those. But in a nutshell, those are some of the stuff that I find a little bit more effective. Yeah. Was there, was there one thing uh, I want to make sure you touched on? I, what was that thing you put over your tank, man, when you completely covered your tank? Was it a tarp or what was that when you were, what, what were you fighting when you covered your tank? So I, I did it twice. The first time I used cardboard. The second time was a tarp. <laughs> That's what it was. The cardboard was a terrible idea for obvious reason. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> got wet. That's funny. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to it. But hey, you guys go check out his channel because he got all this documented, which is another great thing. Document, document, document. Uh, let's go back over to Reef Dudes. He touched on it earlier about things he did to prevent it. Was there any other additional things you want to add to that? That you've done or that you've heard about? Um, so I like a couple of quick things. I believe it was yourself and Michael touched on this earlier, but when you're first setting up a tank and you're cycling your rock, make sure you keep those lights off because that's the point where any rock or there's any extra nutrients like is going to be more leached out in your water. 
And if your lights are on, all you're doing is feeding that algae growth, right? So you, you definitely want to make sure everything's cycled. You know, leave the lights off. You know, you can, if you want to look at your tanks, use the ambient room light, but don't put, you know, your high powered lights over top of your thing or you're just going to be growing algae. Now, another couple of the points he touched on too, uh, how much, Michael said, like in the cave, how much detritus build up underneath. Um, one thing a lot of people don't necessarily do is vacuum their sand bed very often. It's something I probably try to do maybe once a month. They'll just take like a quarter or a third of the tank and just suck up all the stuff in there. That makes a big difference from getting that stuff out of the water and not letting it build up over time. Now, same thing if you, yep, in your sump, if it flows through, if you're using filter socks, I mean, that can catch a lot of that detritus. But if you're not using socks, then it's going to build up in like a lower flow section of your sump. So you got to make sure that's something you look at it, you know, every couple of months, give it a vacuum and clean out and get all that little bits of stuff out of there. It's going to break down and just create excess nutrients that will help feed algae growth in your tank. There you go. There you go. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, as far as, well, let me switch over to make sure I don't, I don't leave out Mike on this too, because I know he's overcame some. Um, you touched on it earlier. You know, you didn't realize some of the mistakes are some of the detritus pockets you had until you shut down the tank. Um, what did you do different on this system to completely avoid it? What things specifically can you speak to or things you are going to try to do to avoid it? Um, so basically with this system, like I said earlier, one of the things that I did to avoid um, potentially having a buildup of nutrients in the system is I changed the way that the tank was scaped. I put less rock on the floor of the tank because... The more areas there are for, you know, for, for detritus and stuff to get trapped, the more, you know, the more likelihood there is for nutrient levels, which means the more food available for hair algae. So, you know, basically it's just being proactive with your system, you know, just be proactive and, you know, keep it clean, you know, keep it clean. Uh, also as well, scape. Scape is something that a lot of people don't think about. And by scape, I mean the position of your rocks. Now, just throwing a big pile of rocks together and just going, boom, I'm done, sometimes can be a real big problem, as I found with the previous tank, because you can't get in there. And, you know, say, for example, I created a cave and all of the fish at night were using that cave as their sleeping spot. Now, all of those fish were also crapping in that cave which built up and built up and then the way that the flow was flowing the flow was going through the cave so any food or anything was getting trapped in the cave and over time over a year's time it was just building up and building up and building up until it got to the point where i couldn't do anything to stop it because there was just so much waste in there so what i did was to obviously counteract that was make sure that there is very small amounts of rock on the floor. So I've got a larger, you know, surface so that I can get in and out the nooks and crannies, a bit like what Devin was saying when it comes to doing like a gravel vac. So one of the major things to help combating um, hair algae is just don't give it the food. You know, don't feed it. It's like with anything, you know, if you don't feed something, it's going to die. And that's the thing. You know, when people say, I really need to get rid of hair algae, but I don't want to stop feeding my fish so much. Well, <laughs> you know you're fighting an uphill battle there um the bio load that you're producing in your tank you need to be able to deal with it you need to be able to counteract it with filtration you know you need to be able to skim out the excess you need to be able to use mechanical filtration to, to get rid of the excess and things like that so that you're not um having too much in your system you're not having too much of a build-up so you're not providing the food to the hair algae in this system now, I don't have any. I have a little bit, which is just enough to sustain my algae blenny and my tank, but I don't have much at all. And that's because I'm being proactive with how much I feed. I'm only feeding as much as I need. I'm also being conscious about the amount of fish in my system and I'm not overdoing it. One big thing and one big of advice is always to remember, you know, st stock your tank to your tank's capabilities not what you want it to do because you might want 500 tanks in a 120 gallon system you can't do it because you, you just your tank just can't cope with that so you know just make sure that you always get it in your mind that stuck your tank to its capabilities and that will help you out you know by no all means um and then just monitoring it from there and if you if you can't maintain your levels on your own by you know 
fish levels and food levels, then you can start looking into helpful ways like, you know, skimmers and using GFO and all of the other things like that. But definitely first port of call is be proactive and make sure that you run your tank in the best possible way possible so that you don't get a big buildup of nutrients. Yep, 100% agree. And I'll tell you what, it's kind of a, a common trend of if you guys are listening of what we all are talking about experience wise. And a lot of it has to do with nutrients, managing your nutrients, having great husbandry, making sure you don't have things building up. Now, one thing um, we didn't really talk about as much was the different ways of managing those nutrients as far as your export methods. What are you going to do to keep those nutrients in control? Now, to kind of share what happened on this 120, you guys understand that, you know, OK, I didn't cure it. But how did I get past not curing it? Eventually, what ended up happening to get me over that hurdle? Well, everything in this rock was breaking down. You know, it was given the algae that food source for it to grow. And it wasn't until I ended up doing a blackout on the tank, a seven day blackout. I didn't have any corals, which was a great part of this. Seven, seven days, man, seven days. Keep in mind, didn't have corals. All I had was fish. That's part of the reason of, yeah, not not rushing into stocking your tank with corals. Because what will happen is once you put all your corals in there, then you're kind of bound to having to have light on for, you know, for your corals. So even if you want to do a blackout, no one's ever going to do a blackout for seven days with corals in their tank. It's just not going to happen. You're going to end up with dead corals. But because of me doing the blackout, it allowed my algae scrubber, my version of nutrient export on my tank, to physically take a hold of the situation. You know, the algae scrubber was losing the battle with my display and the lights, you know, out competing the algae scrubber, but it wasn't until I did the blackout and allowed the scrubber to take back over that I finally got a foothold on this situation. So the people that want to do blackouts, I asked you, what's your export? What's happening during the blackout? Do you have something else physically removing what's available in the water as you're starving the display? You can't just starve it and then leave everything in the tank, turn the lights back on, it's going to come back. What are you doing to get it out? So that's just something to think about. I don't know if you guys want to jump in randomly here, if you want to share or talk about anything. It's definitely a fair point what you made there about, you know, you know, obviously you've got to make sure if you, if you do have air algae or anything like that and, you know, you do a blackout or, you know, whatever it is that you do, you've got to remember that these food sources that your you know that your hair algae is feeding on you know is feeding on carbon dioxide it's feeding on oxygen it's feeding on light and it's feeding on your nutrients so these things you know the, the oxygen the carbon dioxide the light you know if you've got corals you can't get rid of those so you know as soon as you turn the lights back on the carbon dioxide and the oxygen still there the light's going to be on all of the food sources are back boom then comes your hair algae again because um so if you can get your nutrient levels down then you know you're taking one of those food sources away so it's going to struggle but like what cj said you can also do an alternative where if you struggle with all those three you can out compete the hair algae from your display and and grow hair algae or grow algae somewhere else so these things like refugiums now, a refusion mm -hmm. basically is a section of your tank. You know, you can either have it as part of your tank or you can have it, you know, separate, whatever, as long as it's connected. A refusion is basically an area where you congregate algae. So you can have like macro algae, which are a bit more pleasing to the eye. Um, inappropriate reefer was mentioning about grape algae and things like that. You can have various different algae, which look quite nice. Or you can, mm -hmm. you know, use something like what CJ uses, which is an algae scrubber. And what that does is that um, congregates the growth of hair algae in one spot. And then when there's too much, you just scrape it away, throw it in a bin, and then it keeps on growing in this spot. Mm -hmm. So you're just out competing the thing. So it doesn't grow in your display. It grows somewhere else. Refugiums and, and, yeah. and, and um, algae scrubbers are fantastic for helping you out in this situation and can really help you continue the way that you run your tank without having to get very anal with how you feed and how you stock. It's like a little bit of like, you know, again, what Inappropriate was saying, um, it's like a bit of a Band-Aid. You know, it's not, you know, you're not solving the problem. You know, you're putting a little Band-Aid over it, but it'll do. You know what I mean? It's, it's doing the job and you're just well, collecting it somewhere else. Different types, because we were actually running on 
they're out five five to seven minutes here before we're going to call it but i want to touch on a couple other things really quick and i want reef dues and appropriate jump on them too the, the type of nutrient export you have michael has a fantastic refugium with pods this big reef dues has something special go ahead so a couple other things so at, at the end of the day you need to export as much nutrients as you're putting in in order to not have it build up over time right so like Michael was just saying about out competing the algae or having your algae grow somewhere where you want it to grow versus in your display where you don't want it goes a long way. Now in my tank, I used to have a refugium, which I turned into a frag rack. So now I have a Chato reactor growing in there. Um, so that's another great thing. If you have a nano or you have a tank or you don't have a sump, you don't have a space to do it. You can use a big reactor chamber and put a bunch of lights around it and grow algae in that container. Now there's a few advantages, like it keeps it all contained. It's like a nice kind of clean way of doing it. And you don't really have to worry about it dunking up other places. It keeps your tank nice and neat. So that's been working very well in my tank. Now, I've also had the regular refugium, which also works extremely well, providing you have a good light source. So if you use your $4 CFL light, you, you know it's not going to be the same kind of performance as like a 50 or 100 watt LED on it. So that does kind of go a long way of how much light power you're putting into it. Um, ideally, you, you want to put more light or more power, more intensity on your algae than you do in your display tank, right? So it's more likely to grow in that area than in your tank. So that does go kind of a, a, a long way of preventing it from showing up in your tank. No doubt, no doubt. Inappropriate reefer, what kind of export are you running? Is, is, would you do anything different with it? Have you went through a few things as far as your export methods besides eating your algae? <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's algae, a side right benefit. That's, that's a side benefit. That. Yeah. There you go. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but I guess I'm a little bit more, uh, I would say, like old school or traditional. Uh, in terms of export, I do skimmer. I do um, refugium, grow macroalgae. I'll pull them out. And of course, I'll do my water change. Um, I have been really curious about those um, Cheeto reactor or algae reactor that uh, Dev mentioned, and I would love to try that one day. Um, but at the moment, I just, just out of room down in the stand, and I'm kind of nervous about running it outside the outside the tank. You know, what I mean, in case of leak and stuff like that. Um, but in terms of export, that's what I'm doing at the moment. And so far, it seems to be okay. Um, obviously, I still have some algae issue, but it's not it's not terrible to the point where I have to like look into alternative right away. And in the past, I did try GFO for a bit, and that really helped. But later on, I took it offline, noticed that the tank was doing just fine. So I just tried to keep things a little bit simpler. Another thing as well mm -hmm. um, is um, basically, you know, you're talking about out competing your algae. Your corals will also do that as well, you know, because your corals yes. consume yes. nutrients. Your corals will consume nitrates and phosphates. So, you know, all of these different things, like say, for example, if you have a look at um, inappropriate reefer screen, just next to his left ear, you'll see like a red collection in his tank that's macroalgae isn't it so you're utilizing macroalgae in your display so that macroalgae right there is actually consuming nutrients as well but it's also a little display piece so um you know there's loads of things within the system that will consume nutrients but what you're when you do a test so when you get your test kit out what you're testing for is what is available so after your corals have had their fill after your refugiums had its fill you know everything that consumes all nutrients that's what's left it's a bit like when you've had your dinner and you've got a little bit of food left on the plate you've had everything that you can eat you know you can't eat anymore and that's what's left and that's basically what you're testing for so what you need to do is make it so that that little bit is also getting consumed so you know you need to put that little bit of extra effort into either making smaller portions you know what i mean so that that little bit doesn't get left over or you know, mm -hmm. providing something else or like, you know, giving something else in the tank to feed on it. So like we were saying earlier about refugiums and, um, and, and turf scrubbers and stuff, basically they're taking that leftover bit of food and eating it just like you would feed it to your dog or whatever, mm -hmm. rather than it being waste and, you know, coming things. So, you know, there's loads and loads of things that you can do to really easily get on top of nutrients like phosphates for example are so easy so so easy you can dose a little bit of lanthium chloride which is like a liquid you just dose it in your tank it pulls it right down and then you can use like gfo to maintain it low you know you can use refugiums you can use you know i think there's loads and loads of stuff to really make it yep. easy and it's not as difficult as you you know as you think so let me ask you how you guys this and this will kind of be our last i guess uh 
last little spot on this before we have to wrap this up. What are you guys' thoughts on, you know, relying on those chemicals, those uh, miracle cures, the fluconazoles, the phosphate removing liquid that you just mentioned? I forgot what you said it was. You know, me personally, I'm more of a hands in the tank with my be easy toothbrush, you know, scrubbing the rock, doing water changes, uh, just refusing to need or rely on GFO, Fosgard, or any of those other things. And that's pretty much what I did in this tank, and I was able to defeat it. Do you guys feel it's beneficial to go ahead and use those miracle pills, or do you think, you know, you're better off just doing, getting your hands dirty and just managing your tank manually? What do you guys think about that? All you all can chime in on this. I think, ideally, the less stuff you throw in your tank, the better. So if you can do it manually and you don't need these little extra helpers, I think you're far better off. You know, having a natural way of destroying algae and refugium is probably the simplest way to deal with a lot of it. And by far the easiest. Clean up crews too, right? Yep. Um, same thing, like putting your fish to work for you. If you have a small tang in your thing, you can pick off algae. If you have like a lawnmower blend or something like that, like that, that's kind of a natural way of doing with it. I mean, you could feed less if you do have some extra nutrients. I mean, throwing some shade over in a sump with the lights is probably the easiest way to deal with it. I think personally, I say like, don't rely on these things. You know, a skimmer, for example, a skimmer isn't necessary as long as you can run your system right. The thing is, is finding balance. It's all about finding that balance. You know, the right amount of food going in for the right amount of, you know, things of ways of getting it back out again. You know what I mean? So when you say using all these liquids and miracle cures and things, you don't need to. They're, they're there to help you after the fact. You know, if, if you want to, you know, if you can't maintain it yourself, then they're there to help you. But realistically, like I said earlier on in the thing, is be proactive with your system and really, you know, look into what it is that is going in there which is you know gonna up your nutrient levels and stuff so you know you don't need all of these things you don't need a skimmer you don't need lanthium chloride you don't need gfo you know realistically you could get away with not even having refugiums and surf scrubbers and all that lot as long as you put in exactly what is being taken out you know you put any more in you're gonna have the excess right and then you're gonna have more food for you right. you know for the other stuff to to yeah. feed on just one throws yep. out there, but it's 100% right. Yep. Especially on a smaller, on especially on a smaller tank, literally a weekly water change is all you need, yeah. right? It's just as you scale up in size, where it becomes less economical to do a big water change, is becomes more of an issue. Like a 30 gallon tank or less, five gallon water change a week is probably all you'd ever need. Yeah, and I think yeah, you mentioned it as well earlier on, Dev, about the uh, when you start off with a tank. Because like with anything, you've got to start off with the foundations. If you get your foundations right, if you start off right, then you're going to be you know tip top. So like we were saying earlier about when you start a new system, you know the lights don't turn them on. I see it loads and loads of times where people turn the lights on and they've got nothing in there, you know, or they might have right. a f or have a fish. Fish don't need that light. You know, fish right. are perfectly fine with no lights on. So the great way to do it is like what CJ did when he started his tank is start off with your fish first. Get your fish in there, you know, mm -hmm. bit by bit. Don't just bomb loads of fish. You're bit by bit, let your tank be able to keep up with what with what's going on, with what's being produced with your fish. Let everything get established mm -hmm. and get everything stable and, you know, get that get that balance of what's going in and what's coming out. And then you can start turning your lights on and finger because already everything is in balance and then start buying corals, you know, do it that way. If, you know, if you don't know what to do. So, you know, yeah, there was definitely valid points earlier about, you know, turning lights on and stuff like that at the beginning. You don't need them. You know, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't even there need a skimmer at the beginning. If you, you know, as long as you do it, you know, as long as you set up right and don't get uh -oh. too giddy. As long as you're balancing it, inappropriate. Let you finish this out. Uh, your thoughts as far as these miracle cures pills if you would ever use them and then we'll wrap it up yeah um i mean i totally agree with what michael and dev said and i think they pretty much said it all i have really nothing else to add except yeah. I, I actually learned a lot today i learned a lot mm -hmm. i learned to see certain things from a different perspective um especially when michael mentioned that seeing whatever you could test almost as a leftover mm -hmm. right i think that's a really really interesting way of seeing right. it and really uh put things into perspective so uh this is great Good deal. Good deal, man. Well, I'll tell you what, everyone that's watching, hopefully you all uh, 
if you are new, you know, because I really feel like there's so many new people. This is a great time for the hobby because there's so many new people joining. And I'm by no means an expert in any of this, but I can speak from experience that algae is something you can overcome uh, with, you know, if you decide to go those miracle routes, they work. I'm not going to lie. I've seen people say have the success with those methods. But honestly, as long as you are controlling your nutrients and you set up a proper proportioned method of export to your tank, to the stock list, to what you're going to be putting in it you can be successful. Now, there are a few things, a few research topics I would encourage you all to do that we didn't have a chance to talk about during this show. One is going to be the red fuel ratio, uh, you know, the, the relationship between carbon, nitrates, and phosphates in your tank. That's something you definitely should read up on because it will affect you in your battle of trying to get rid of algae. Something else you want to make sure you're reading up on is the different types of rock that are out there, you know, your pecani, your reef saver rock, you know, your live rock that's already cured, the different types of rock that may fit your need, your budget. You know, there's benefits and curses to both, depending on what you want to do. So, you know, with that being said, great, great show, great topic. Um, definitely one that will be relevant forever in this hobby for new and old people. And hopefully you guys enjoyed it. So let's, as we wrap this up, make sure I encourage you all, make sure you stop by Aaron's Aquariums, Inappropriate Reefers, Reef Dudes, and my channel, if you're new here, hit the subscribe button because we definitely are going to keep digging into these topics every week as you guys, uh, you know, ask questions in the chat. We may pick one of your topics, but either way, I think this is a great show and I think it's going to be a great thing moving forward. So next week, we will be over at Reef Dudes. Where are we going to be? That guy. <laughs> Reef Dudes channel. And we're going to cut out. So, as always, hey, you guys like, comment, subscribe. You guys keep doing what y'all do. Y'all be easy and happy reefing.